So we have, okay, the recording is a little bit behind. Um, so that you have here the overview. So P one-sided, and there's now a formula. There's a formula in Excel that allows you to get the P. What's important is that you know which P you're looking at, because now you're positive. You know that your mu is smaller than your X bar. So you have a positive set. So you want that set score to the right, because when you look here at the distribution, you have your one to the left, one to the right. You know your difference is here in the positive realm. So you want to quantify that tail to the right. And then multiply by two to get the two-sided p-value. Right? Okay, good. So now you want to write, and this is where it's getting a little tricky. So this formula says norm dot dist equals norm dot dist. You can again go on the formula editor here on the left top, up here. Can you get this field here on the right? And if you find the formula there, you can fill it out here. So this formula asks you for an X, asks you for a mean, asks you for a standard deviation, which is our standard error. It's not the standard deviation. And asks for a cumulative true or yes, uh, true or false, logically test. So what does this mean? Our X is X bar by 42, right? Our mean is the population mean, which is 500. Our standard deviation as said is the standard error of the mean because we're testing that difference against the standard error of the mean. So we're assuming these random samples of the mean and we're taking this distribution to conduct hypothesis testing. Yeah? X bar, mu, standard error of the mean. And now it's getting a little tricky because uh, cumulative true means that it takes everything from that point that you're calculating now, that difference, everything to the left. So it's cumulatively giving you, just like in the set score table, is it? That's the set, set score table. So it gives you, just like here, it goes all the way to 50, where it's zero. And then it goes even further, the higher it gets, the more it gets closer to one, up until 3.45, where it stops counting in the table. So Excel does that for you. And when you said cumulative true, it gives you everything to the left. So we get rid of this again. Okay, so 0 0.99. Hmm? Okay. I show you the box again. So here it's norm dot test B2, B3, B7, and true. <coughs> hmm? Good. All right. So norm dot test gives you 0 0.9985. What does that? Hmm? Yep. No. So this number basically gives you another difference. You, you're calculating a difference and you're trying to characterize this normal distribution of the differences. You have that point on the very right and it gives you everything to the left. But since it's a positive value, you're actually interested in what's to the right, right? And this you get by calculating one minus this value. And this is a little tricky because now you need to go before the formula, before that moon test, and you calculate one minus the other. One minus norm test. So you click into the cell, you get that formula, and you calculate one minus this norm test. 
Yeah. Gives you a very small number, which is 0 0.0014897. So that's a one-sided p-value. So now we know for two-sided testing, we need to consider both tails. So now we have the little tail on the right. And now we know there's a little tail on the left we need to consider too. So we need to multiply this by two and we're doing this by p, yeah. two-sided. We're taking the one-sided p-value and multiply it by two. And that's our p-value. That's the two-sided p-value. Yes. Oh, oh by, uh, by equal sign? Yeah. Equal sign, but, uh, p one-sided multiplied by two. What? Then there's a mistake. Oh, my p one-sided is my number. Yeah. Minus the 33 after one in the P1 side, it's 0.0001487333. 89733. Oh, okay. 89733. Yeah, I can do the two. <laughs> <laughs> now I have the same result as you. It's just when you expand it, it shows you what the SMS is. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. For like you get zero? Just zero. That's not right. Zero is a little confusing. Um oh no, that's Sure. Okay, good. So we have now a two sided p value that means we're taking into account both tails, uh, these tails. So we calculated both of these tails. So now that's the p value with which we are deriving the risk of committing a type one error where we're rejecting something we shouldn't reject when we are saying our sample mean is different from the population mean. So would you say, taking into account an alpha level, we can also con uh, con convert this in a percentage by taking this multiplied by 100. Would you say you're rejecting the null hypothesis or you're accepting the null hypothesis? Hmm? Multiplied by 100. You just multiplied by 100. It was an asterisk. So would you reject it or would you accept it, the null hypothesis? Hmm? So the type one risk, the type one error risk is smaller than 5%. So if you reject, your risk for type one error is 0.3% only, less than 5%. So you're rejecting at a very low risk of a type one error. So as soon as it's smaller than 5%, you're rejecting and you're rejecting this one. But this is the two-sided hypothesis. So now you also, you have one-sided tests, right? And the reason why I'm doing this now is because we want to also understand one-sided tests versus two-sided tests, which tail do we have to pay attention to? So if we're doing a one-sided test, to the left, yes. Multiply by 100. You multiply the proportion by 100. So now a one-sided test to the left tail is essentially a research hypothesis that your mu is essentially larger 
the new X bar. Because when your mu is larger than the X bar, you're subtracting your mu from your X bar. That means your Z score is going to be negative. So you're assuming that your X bar is smaller than your mu. That's your research process. And that's when you're only interested in your left tail, not in the right one, not in both, just in the left one. Your corresponding null hypothesis to X bar is smaller than mu is X bar is greater or equal to mu because you're looking for a difference, right? So now this is essentially this scenario. So here we're testing, you remember the cholesterol uh, level example, right? So here we tested against uh, another hypothesis that this was not significantly different. And we found this to be non-significantly different because multiplying the p-values by two gave us a p-value greater than 5%. Now we're testing this example where our mu, our sample mean, is smaller than 211, which is our mu. So that's when everything is interested into the left tail. So now the calculation per se is the same. The calculation is again, B2 minus B3 divided by B7. So it's the same calculation. It's the same calculation as in the neighboring cell. Yeah? Can you go back on that line? Sure. That's a minus. So this is this formula, right? Is x bar minus mu divided by standard error of the mean. Yes. The percentage. Yes. Is it supposed to be the same number as the one next to it? That's the same number. So, so this being said, so we have now a, a one-sided p-value that we're interested only. Which tail we know, and this is why it's really important to kind of map this out to to really depict. Like with a pen or paper, uh, map out this normal distribution. Which one are you interested? You're interested in a mu that's larger than your x bar. So your x bar is smaller than your mu. So you're interested in the left tail only. So when you do that norm dist again, you're cumulatively taking everything to the left of that set score that you have calculated. So when you have a P one sided, and your set is 2.96, and you're interested in your p, you do norm.dist, your x is 542, your mu is 500, your standard deviation is the standard error of the mean, as we know, and now it's true. So this is, yes? So this is this formula, right? So we're interested in everything to the left. This is exactly what that formula gives us. So that means our risk of committing a type one error when we're rejecting 542 to a population mean to 500 is 99.9%. So it's almost certain that we're committing that one error if we say this sample is different from the population mean. We don't need to calculate the two-sided because it's a one-sided test. Percentage, yes, we can multiply this by 100. We don't need to do that, but for, this, for the sake of completeness, let's do it. And now we're gonna do the corresponding one-sided right test. Wait, what if you do like 
at the bottom. Uh, I multiplied the proportion by 100. So that's the final percentage of committing a tap on error, that, that risk of committing tap on error. So now our research hypothesis, now we're interested in the right tail. Now the research hypothesis is that X bar is greater than the mu. So X bar is greater than the mu. Because we're only interested in whatever happens to the right. So now we're interested in this scenario. Everything to the right is interesting. So we are calculating a set score exactly with that formula. And everything to the right of the set score is important. So if we're clicking now, uh, we're calculating exactly the same. We do B2 minus B3 divided by B7. Same formula again as we did before. Gives us now a P one-sided of one minus norm dot dist B2, B3, B6, not B7, and true. Gives us now that value that we've calculated before. Hmm? Yeah, it's the same formula we had before. Because now this is the probability to the right of our set score. Yeah. And this essentially multiplied by 100 is a p value smaller than 5%, and we're rejecting. So we, we do not reject this one because it's 0. Point, no, we do, if we do reject, we reject. We do not reject this one, and we reject this one, right? Smaller than 5%, smaller than 5%, greater than 5%. Yep. This one? Oh, that's just this one multiplied by 100. But makes sense, right? It's like the, the difference you're interested in is essentially driving your hypothesis. And your hypothesis in that <laughs> regard drives the percentage you're interested in. But it is in that context, it's very important to kind of understand in which direction you, your interest goes. All right? It's simple. It's considerably easy, right? It's just, you got to understand the concept and the direction in which uh, the tail you're interested in. Okay. Can you reject the one-sided right test? Yes. Because the X bar is greater than mu. So the corresponding null hypothesis X bar is smaller equal to mu. Good. So this is this is basically the first question. This is so we have now we calculated the spread, we calculated the standard error of the mean. We went through all the six steps of hypothesis testing. We determined p-values for two-sided, one-sided hypothesis tests in both directions. Now we're gonna calculate the confidence interval, which we know. It's easy, right? Now we do uh, Q1E. That's confidence intervals. For this reason, we need to understand what the confidence interval is. Uh, it's basically, uh, the thresholds of our 2.5% on both sides. So, no. I'll mute myself. What am I doing? Okay, uh, now we want this, this, no, not this, we want this. So we know that 1.96 is that value we're really interested in because that gives us the 2.5% probability, right? To the left and to the right. So to calculate the confidence interval, we basically, we need to know a mean, which we know from the sample is 542. 
So now we need a lower limit and upper limit. And the lower limit is calculated as 542 minus 1.96 for the set score multiplied by the standard error of the mean, which is B7. So this gives us a lower limit of 514.3. B25 minus 1.96 multiplied by B7. This is the mean. This is the set score, the critical value of 2.5% to the left. This is B7, that's the standard error of the mean. Yeah? Can we do parentheses after the... Uh, no, here you don't need parentheses because as you remember, uh, subtraction has a lower rank as compared to multiplication and division. So in the hacking order here, you basically have the multiplication before the subtraction. Yes? The mean? Oh, the 542 comes from the question. Yeah, that's those for, for it. Okay. And now when we want the upper limit, we basically were doing 542 plus 1.96 multiplied by B7, which is the standard error of the mean, gives us 569.7. Okay. Same thing. We're just we're adding now 1.96 multiplied by the standard error of the mean. So this essentially gives us now a mean, which is, so this is how you will write it in a research publication. In your thesis, in a research paper down the road, you will write to express this in this fashion. You can say 95% CI, you say 514 to 570. This is how you're expressing this. This gives you here the mean, and then a parenthesis, the 95% confidence in the world, 514 and 570. So when you look now at this 95% confidence in the interval, you already clearly see whether you would reject or not reject the null hypothesis, because you see that the population mean is not contained in the 95% confidence in the world which already strongly suggests, or which actually confirms that it's not contained in that interval. And the definition of the confidence interval is like, this is that interval with when, within which I'm 95% confident that the population mean is located in. So if I'm 95% confident the population mean would be located in here, the rest of that is 5%, so I'm already 5% confidence that the population mean is not contained in this interval. Right? So you essentially, you can now assume this is significantly different. Good. So this is Q1E, that's the confidence interval. And then we have Q1F, which is the effect size. And that's easy. We know the effect size basically takes sample size out of the calculation and basically it takes sample size out and makes uh, the difference relative to the variability of the scores in the population. So you essentially you get an effect size ES by calculating B2 minus B3 divided by the sigma, the sigma is 100. So your effect says here is 0 0.42. Reason for that is because if you have a large sample size, it's going to be more likely that you significantly that you reject that you get a significant set score for the sake of the standard error of the mean getting smaller just for the sample size. Right? So by dividing it by the standard deviation of the population, you essentially you get an estimate of the true difference in relationship to the variability in the population. Now we know that uh, 0 0.42 is a small effect size. So 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 is small, 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 is medium, 
and everything greater than 0 0.8 is large. So this is the effect set. And that was example number one. This one? Yeah. B2 minus B3 divided by B4. Okay. Was that clear? Makes things a little easier. What I think is the good exercise here is to really force yourself to think about this relationship here. Because here you see which tails you're interested in. So this is two-sided. You gotta multiply it by two. This is the one where you're interested in the left tail. And this is where you're interested in the right tail. And this is how you're approaching it. And this is how you need to, you color, you literally, I would recommend you in case of doubt with one-sided hypothesis tests, map out a normal distribution, think about where is this difference gonna be located and then just draw it out on the normal distribution. It's really that easy and, and you avoid mistakes. Okay, good. Second example. It's basically the first example just with different numbers. But it is, it is a good exercise to repeat it with different numbers because the use case scenario is different now. So if we go now to the second example, any questions to the previous example? Anything that wasn't clear? I know it's a repetition, right? For, for some of you, it's, it's redundant and it is redundant, but practicing this uh, will improve understanding and will help to memorize it in much detail. Okay, so second example. It's always, a nice, uh, it's always a nice exercise in Excel, right? Uh, so this is also the day when you have questions about Excel, it's like, shoot your questions. So in case there's anything you want to expressively talk about. Good, same question. You're conducting a set test on a sample of 132 people for whom you observed a mean verbal score on the SAT of 490. Population mean is 500, standard deviation is 100. Good, same scheme. Same setup, different numbers. You have N of 32, uh, what, zoom in a bit. All right, let me transfer this over. So now you can bring this table that we had here. You can literally copy this over. But just a, just a table. Not the formula calculations because this we need to do again. Um, okay, so we have an N of 132. We have an X bar of 490. We have an uh, mu of still 500. Standard deviation still 100. Mu 500, sigma 100. Okay, same setup. Same hypothesis, we have the population parameters. We have the sample statistics that we need. Now we need to calculate the standard error of the mean again, which is same thing. SEM equals sigma divided by square root of the N. Oops. So standard error of the mean is 8.7. Yeah. Good. Okay. Two sided test. We're calculating X bar, which is B2 minus the mu, which is B3 divided by the standard error of the mean, which is B7. No? Well, it's the same formula. Yeah, yeah I used the same cells again. Uh, so you need to subtract the population mu, which is, I don't know which cell on your sheet, from the sample. Yeah. 
um, x bar yeah. minus mu divided by standard error of the mean. Yes. B7 is the standard error of the mean. So what is that? B4? No, that's B7. Oh, B7 is square root of B4. B7 is B4 by the square root of N. How do I take that? It's just the square root of B4. Yeah. Can I go back to the chart? I don't really have it. I lost it. B2 minus B3 divided by B7. How did you get to 7? Yeah, I couldn't get to 7. That was my problem. So you go back to B7. So it, okay, okay, step by step. Okay, we go back to B7. We do B4, which is the sigma, divided by square root, which is B1. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's a love hate relationship with Excel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So B7 is B4, uh, the B4 divided by square root of B1. Sorry. Yeah? Don't apologize. Okay, I got it. Good. Thank you. Not a problem. Well, All right. Let's continue. Yeah. All right, so we calculate set score by B2 minus B3 divided by B7. Now we have a P one-sided. Again, we just want the tail. So now we know that that set score is already negative. Hmm? 1.428, that's interesting. I did B2 minus B3 divided by uh, this one. Yes, is what? What is yours? Minus 418, but I was. 418. Yeah, Okay. I'm selling it. B2 minus B3. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Good. So now the set score is negative. That means we are already left to the mean, right? So now we want to have that percentage to the left. We want to have that p value to the left. So minus 1.14 is 1.14 is here. 0.1271. So now, but we want to calculate it. So we're doing now norm.dist. Uh, the x is, I forgot it, 490, I believe, 490. The mean is 500. The standard deviation is 8.7. And cumulative is true. Gives us 0 0.125296. Norm dot test the mean of the sample, the mean of the population, the mu, the standard error of the mean as the variability of the differences between the random sample means and the population mean and cumulative equals true. Yeah? Good. So P2 sided, we remember. We're interested in both tails. It's symmetric. So we have the left tail. Now we want to multiply this by two to get to a two-sided p-value, 0 0.25. This multiplied by 100 is 25%. Are we rejecting? Absolutely not. Hmm? Yes. Which one? That one? One more down. Yeah, that one. This is just uh, the, the cell above multiplied by two.
Okay. Which one? That one. So it's basically you do here the estimation of your tail to the left. You multiply it by two to get both tails, and you multiply it by 100 to get your percentage. All right. So now you're hypothesizing that x bar is smaller than mu. Under the null hypothesis, that x bar is greater or equal than mu. So you know your set. Your set is the same as it's here. It's minus 1.15. So it's again B2 minus B3 divided by B7. Same formula as this one. The norm dist, we're again going towards the left. And this is B2, B3, B7, and true. 0.125, same formula. Are we going to multiply it by two? No, because it's once at the test, right? Good. The final percentage is this, oops, is this multiplied by 100. Are we rejecting? No, because it's greater than 5%, not to reject. Oops. No. So same story for the third example. Now we're uh, hypothesizing that X is greater than mu. We are calculating B2 minus B3 divided by B7. Gives us the minus 114 again. So now it's getting a little bit trickier because now our research hypothesis is actually everything to the right. And now we again, we need to calculate this one minus this to the left. So now we're calculating equals one minus norm dot dist B2, B3, B7, true. Gives us a p-value of 0 0.875 and change. So it's one minus norm dist. And why is that? Because we're calculating a difference. We're dividing it by the standard error of the mean. We get a set score, which is to the left of the mean. We're interested in something that is to the right of that difference, that standardized difference. And now we're quantifying everything that's greater. This is why we're taking the whole and we're subtracting everything to the left of that difference, of that standardized difference. That's our p-value. So they're both not significant. So this multiplied by 100 is not to reject either. So we have essentially done this already. You have already taken the midterm on the topic, but I think it's very important to see this mapped out on one table to really 100% fully comprehend this topic. And I think it's, it's worthwhile to have this mapped out. Yeah. How is it possible to say that the X bar is both less than and greater than? It's the probability of rejecting, right? because that's driven by the variability of these means. This is a probability and it's not, it's not inherently kind of going together. So the variability, if you have a variability, this comes with a certain probability and a certain risk, right? But yeah, it's not intuitive, but if you look here, for example, these p-values, they always add up to a one, right? So there's an inherent relationship to each other but you need to look at these uh, exclusively, independently. And you would hypothetically, you would not do an analysis like that. You would not map it out like, but this is just to illustrate. 
Good. So this is essentially, we have 15 more minutes. This is amazing. Good. So we can do R. Okay. Any questions to this? Good. I think it's just super important to kind of really. Uh... <laughs> well, did you think we're not going to do this in R? Okay, so we have, <laughs> yeah, well, that was our, our studio. Our studio. It's not scary, don't be, don't be scared. <laughs> so, okay, first of all, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, to make it fair with the, uh, with the class before, uh, I didn't get timely to R. So I'm going to record this as a video. I'm going to also post a video uh, to your guys' canvas. The deliverable for today's practice quiz is that Excel spreadsheet. Okay. So please upload the Excel spreadsheet with both examples. That's the deliverable on the on the practice lab. For no, we're doing R now. The hand in the submission. The submission is the Excel spreadsheet. No, you don't. Have because the problem would be not fair to the other class. So. Okay. So we have. Hmm? Okay. So again, we are now uh, emptying the environment. So I will post this code for you to have it at your disposition. Yeah. Let me let me post this uh, practice lab. Um, yeah, you should you should be able to open it. Um, I'm I'm posting as an announcement the practice lab code. Uh, So, yeah, it comes out of an announcement in a second. Okay, so you have this now as an announcement out in a second. No. Okay, so this is now to download. Um, so the reason why I think this is just nice to see to see how R can be utilized. So essentially for these things, you don't need the statistical software. You don't need the software. You need the calculator at the very most usual. Yeah. You need to right click it and you need to say open with. Okay, so essentially all that R is doing here, and this is... Um, I uh, just just download it from Canvas. I've posted no, I'm it. Saying, as... I'm saying submitting the Excel. I actually just submitted it as practice. As practice, is that okay? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Like well, I would appreciate put your name in it. Uh, you just resubmit it. You just gave me an eye roll. <laughs> okay. okay, so we do rm list equals ls. Hmm? No? All right. Okay, uh, you need to first download the safe and guess. Download it somewhere and then uh, click it from there. Okay. So rm list equals ls will uh, clear the environment. 
Then we have a mu uh, that is essentially, uh, it becomes here an object where you just assign a singing number to. So this is essentially nothing. Uh, this is what I mean. It's like, it's not really something for R. It's just showing you how to do these calculations essentially in R. That's all that value of this practice lab essentially was. That's why I'm not necessarily to. Did it work for you? Yeah. Thank you. You don't have to end this in. Okay, so you essentially you have uh, here assigned to all these four objects, you assign these values, these numerical values that we have in R just put into B2, B3, B4. And here you do the same kind of calculations. You get the same kind of values assigned to the objects that are here labeled accordingly. And then you just, you calculate again, here the set score and the set you're displaying it here the only advantage here doing these calculations with r is because you're saving it and you don't need to refer to cells but you can just call them uh, from what you have what you can do then here is you can calculate with p norm so when you do p norm and an absolute set that you always set negative you always get this tail, right? So our set is now 2.97. And that's supposed to do one minus or not one minus as we have done in Excel. All we're doing here with P norm app set is like we're setting set absolute. So it will be positive. And then we're saying a priori, make it negative in all cases. So by that you actually you always get that left tail irrespective of whether it's positive or negative, it just creates a general rule for it to only be to the left. So it gives you always the tail to the left. This is why R makes it, makes it a little easier. So if you do a two-tailed analysis, you basically you have a P two-tailed, you just multiply this by two, and this doesn't work because I didn't run this. So you basically, you get here that P value that we calculated here with R. If you have a one-tailed hypothesis, again, the most important thing here is that you again know which direction are you interested to investigate. So if you do P one-tailed smaller, you basically you, you're taking the cumulative. So P norm set of this set score will give you everything cumulatively to the left. This is the code to do that. So you get here, essentially, you get the 0 0.99. So if you do a one tail test where you calculate it to the crater, you're basically calculating one minus P norm. So it's the same calculations as we did. Um, and this, again, emphasizes my point. It's, it's really not about the tools you're using. It's really that you conceptually understand what you're doing. And this is why. Uh, repeating those concepts is just so important. So this is the calculations of the confidence intervals, just in the same fashion as we did in Excel. You basically, you calculate X bar minus 1.9 multiplied by the SEM is the same kind of calculation, just using now uh, objects that contain these numbers. So you can address each of these objects and it will automatically use this value that is stored in the object for all kinds of arithmetic operations. So you get a lower limit and upper limit. This is consistent with what we calculated. Then we have here an effect size, which is also consistent. So essentially all that was needed for this uh, practice lab was essentially to run this through copy and text file and that's it. So nothing spectacular that was expected. So here we have the same example for 7.3. So we have a mu of 500, we have sigma of 100 and x bar of 490. We have an n of 132, which we remember the standard error of the mean is 8.7, just like in Excel. And again, the same calculations, we're getting to a set of minus 1.15. And we can calculate again with this formula, P norm of minus absolute set. The set is, will always be, with this formula alone, it will always be positive. So this basically, this changes the sign 
and this will always be positive. And you're doing that because by that, when you always set it positive and you give it a negative sign a priori, you essentially will always in all cases have a negative sign. So this is now negative, right? So and even if you would change the set to something that is uh, positive, you again get always a negative value. And you do that because on the set score table, you will always get everything to the left. And if you want only that tail and understand what the P behind the tail is, you need to do that to make this standardized. So P2 tailed is now the 0 0.25. And if we do the same exercise with a one tail test, we get here again the 0 0.13. And here the 0 0.874 that we've calculated or the lower limits of the lower and upper limits of the confidence intervals is the same. And the effects are also consistent with what we've seen in Excel. So here this uh, the conclusion according to uh, the classification of Cohen. Yeah. And that was pretty much all. So that was the our lab in, in very fast terms. Uh, with the Excel spreadsheet, please submit that Excel spreadsheet. Go over the calculations. Make sure you really understand those. This will be very central to what's coming your way with T distribution and with ANOVAs. Any last final questions? Yes. No, <laughs> please, <laughs> please, please submit it as an Excel sheet. <laughs> All right. Yes, as the Excel. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yes. Like when we did, we did like the, like we did the confidence interval and all that, but for the second Thank you one, so much. Here, right? Not yet. Yes, well, but please do. Oh, good point. Thank you for the reminder. Yes, please do. Please do the effect sizes and the confidence intervals. Wait, what? We have to or no? Yeah. No, please. Yeah, it's, it's the same formula. Wait, so we can just copy it? Yeah. Just, just assign the cells. Wait, we have to do that. Yeah. Wait, nobody knows this. I know. What? Thank okay. you. Drop it. Oh, so it's yeah, drop it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, it's, okay. Yeah, no, okay. Just, okay. Um, I'm trying to save this. It's not letting me use it. I don't know how to save it to my one drive. Hmm? I don't know how to save it to my one drive. Oh, that's a problem. No. So how did they do it before? It's not letting me hit, like, how much do you save this? Open it on your uh, Office 365. How did you do it before? I forgot. <laughs> so if you open it on Office, if you open it on Office 365, you have an Excel at your disposition, and then she just copy what we just did over. Thank you. You just copy this over. Okay. So here's Excel, right? Yeah. And here you create a new workbook. Okay. And now you just copy over from the other spreadsheets what we did there. Wait, how do I copy it? By the uh, control C. But how do I do the whole thing? Well, you copy the whole thing. Yeah, so here you can create a new workbook, right? Yeah. Excellent workbook. Yeah. And then you copy over from your other file here. You have all this and you just copy paste this. You click in, you create a new worksheet, you can do control A. And you copy here the whole sheet. Uh, okay. Yep. 805 and 6667. I'm trying to figure out those two. Okay, so, uh, so you have here. Oh. So you are calculating this mean minus 1.96, right? That's the 2.5%. Multiplied by your standard error of the mean. Uh, and and here you add it. I add these two numbers? No. 
you add this plus 1.96 multiplied by standard error of the mean. Okay, let's do the next one. Into the same yes, you do the same program. It'll work. Thank you. Hmm? I press command Z and it's going to work. Sheet one or sheet two? Uh, no, you can uh, relabel them to the uh, question numbers 7.29 and 7.30. Okay. So, can I resubmit if I already submitted? Or no, once I submitted, that's it. Uh, no, you can resubmit it. Oh, okay. I, I will create the last submission. Okay. And also for this, I don't know why. Did I do these ones right? I don't think so. Oh no, wait. I meant the sheet. Wait, why is it not letting me yeah, do this? Yeah. Oh, whatever. No, this is this is this. Uh, this one I meant. Sorry, yeah. those two. Look good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. You want to go here? I, it's not saving. Like I do this, and then when I go, yeah, to you have file, the same problem. Uh, <laughs> when I do choose file, it says documents and it's not not there it's not anywhere so you have a full version of excel or you also work to the office 365 before yeah i've, I've submitted things before from here like the mm -hmm. homework i submitted them so but usually you were able to save it yeah usually i'm able to save it just popping up okay that's excel where did you save it yeah. See, this is on your OneDrive. You go to find. Where's your folder um, for the class? I know I couldn't figure out how to make one, but I just do it. It pops it at the top whenever. Okay. So I save it on desktop. Huh? Okay, so then should I try again? Yeah, just to find it, right? So now it should be here somewhere on the. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then submit it. Yep. I think I might have the same problem. Sure. I'm not sure though. It just it saves to this, but I can't edit it. Yep. So this is. This uh -huh. is the Microsoft version. Oh, you are on SharePoint. This one doesn't work. Like the actual app, I also okay. have the same exact problem. Then you need to export it somehow, which I'm not sure how to do that from here. Turn on the document, save status. Oh, that just seems like it's safe. To... It saves to this. It doesn't save to my computer. Okay. So I can't send it. So no, you need to find it on the SharePoint, right? Oh, um. You need to find your OneDrive for SharePoint or whatever. You saved it. To... Might be this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that should be somewhere here. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe if I go to Excel and then. Mm. 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 You guys should need training on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It doesn't have to do anything with them. It's just nobody explained it to you, right? I can see it's there, like it's yeah. saved, but then it doesn't save to my computer. Oh, maybe. Share, email, copy link. Convert to PDF. Open. Open desktop app. Yeah, here you should be able to uh, somehow export it. What if I copy the link and then put it as a comment? No, no, no. <laughs> no, there's a way to they export it, right? You just gotta know how to. I've never worked with that. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Save that. Yeah. 
download the copy to your computer. Uh, okay. So the problem is when I open this, it opens it on the Excel app. It doesn't let me send it to you. No, no, no. But you have a location. You have a physical location on your go show in Finder. This is how you get to you. This is the physical file. Yeah. Okay. All right. That looks very much like a PDF. Is that a PC PDF? Oh, no, I'm not supposed to. No. no PDF. We don't do PDF. No? No? Is that different than PDF? No, PDF is, uh, it should be an Excel file. Should we what? An Excel file. I have so now you have a copy. Where's the copy? This is the this is the Office 365. Yeah. So where is this now? So now handing it in is here. So yeah. where now you need to first download it. You need to download the physical copy on your hard drive. Ah, like what this one? This one? Yeah. Okay. Let's go and see this. Okay. You can download the copy. Okay. Um, no, no. Okay. You have a physical copy on your hard drive. Somewhere on the hard drive. Yeah. Which one is it? So now you need to find a folder. Let's find it. Oh. It's here in your finder somewhere. Let's see a practice So this is. That's the physical file. This is the file. This is to submit. Yeah. Should I submit? All right. Good. Professor, yes. I forgot to use Excel because they gave me an inventory list. Ah. How's that for everything? And I showed them how to do equals sum. Oh, that is. Power of the, power of the day, so. Thank you. You made my day. <laughs> Good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is normal for them. Should I press OK? Uh, oh, this one. yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah this one. But you need the actual physical file, no? Uh, yes. And let's look what they download. Hold on. Let's not rush. Let's go. Now let's go into Finder. 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 Where's Finder? All the way to the left. Left, left, left. Left, left. Yeah. Okay. okay, so there should be now someone downloads over to this soon. Right, this lab two. Uh, no, no, nothing seems. Okay, okay, let's try. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, where was this first? So, here we are. Yes, this open recovered now. So we want to save this now. We're going to save, save as. Okay. Desktop. Okay. Desktop two. You can rename this then with your name and everything. Is it okay if I send it in with this? Hmm? No, 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 please rename it as your name and, and the course number. So, two. Okay, yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Ah, yeah. That's that's the one I want. You're welcome. All right. So we're technical problems resolved. <laughs> so I'm so surprised that you never have gotten really a formal training on the whole office thing. Yeah. Because this will be helpful to you, and you've just heard it from Naomi, right? It's 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 very helpful to have a little bit of at least basic kind of 